Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science for October 2023, our second last Briz Science of the year. Very exciting. My name is Dr. Joel Gilmore, and I am your MC for this evening. This is, of course, Briz Science brought to you by the University of Queensland. This is your first Briz Science, and I do see a wonderfully big crowd here tonight. Welcome. Briz Science is a series of free public lectures about science that is held once a month here at the amazing The Edge as part of the State Library of Queensland, where we aim to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research with Brisbane, and of course, everybody watching this on YouTube afterwards. Um, I would, of course, like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and lands on which we're meeting tonight, and pay my respects to elders past and present. And particularly at this time, as the First People of Australia are looking for recognition in our constitution and seeking to enshrine a voice in their future, in governing the future here in Australia, it's a great opportunity for us to reflect both of our past and our future and what it means for us as a country. So tonight, uh, tonight, a bit of housekeeping before we get into it. First of all, if you've got a mobile phone, please turn it to silent now, but do not switch it off because we are going to be taking questions after our amazing speaker shortly over the, uh, the app. There is the amazing QR code up there. I'm not sure I've ever described a QR code as amazing before, but I'm really feeling it tonight. So if you scan that or enter the web address there, there is a form and we would love you for you to submit your questions. And after the talk, we will get through as many of those as we can. After the talk, there is some food and drink outside because Science should be as much a cultural experience as going to the football or the theatre. Um, although, unlike Hamilton, probably no one's going to get shot tonight. So, tonight, tonight, let's get into it. Uh, I am very excited to introduce our speaker this evening. But unfortunately, as a large language model, I am unable to welcome you to Briz Science. No, I don't think that's right. Uh, my chat GPT might have got into my, uh, my, my script there. But it's a great, uh, great coincidence because tonight's talk is, in fact, about artificial intelligence. And uh, we're going to take a very close look at this because we have seen recently an incredible rise in programs that can do everything from um, win art competitions to uh, write better code than most first years to passing the bar exam. And this is, of course, raising questions about what does the future of our economy look like, our jobs, even the existential future of the human race. And then, of course, there's the big question of what is consciousness? All very big issues. Fortunately, tonight, we have a speaker who is going to answer all of those questions <laughs> and more. It is an incredible brief. It is a five-hour lecture this evening, so um, settle in. Now, we do have an incredible speaker tonight from the University of Queensland School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He has a couple of decades and more experience in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So to take us on a bit of a deep dive, could you please put your hands together for Associate Professor Marcus Gallagher. Thank you, Joel. Um, thanks everyone, um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight and yes, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and probably answer none of those questions, um, but what I do want to do is tell you a little bit of how we got to this point in, in 2023, thinking about AI the way it is, how did we get here? I'd like to tell you a little bit about what the actual science is of AI because uh, there's a lot of talk, but sometimes it's all hype and you don't really get a sense of what's actually going on. What is this thing that people are talking about when they say AI? Um, and then a little bit about some concerns I have, maybe some, some thoughts about the future and where we're going, but um, maybe not all the answers. All right. So let me start by giving you some definition of AI which is a bit of a cop-out, but it's the weak AI definition, and I like it, and I think um, it's enough to give us plenty of trouble just, just with this, okay? So I would say you can think of AI as the automation of intelligent behaviour. 
So it's about building a machine, this is probably a computer program, uh, could be a robot, um, that can behave in such a way that we would consider that behaviour intelligent. So it doesn't really uh, give you a way of um, measuring that behaviour exactly, but it's up to you, all right? You know it when you see it. If you think it's doing something that's cool and intelligent, well, um, we have an AI. And in that sense, I think we actually do have AI that is very good at performing a lot of different specific tasks um, that, that, are, that we've defined very well and, and set up so that, so that the system can work. So that's some sort of definition of AI, but you will very quickly hear about other definitions. Um, and people like to talk, for example, about artificial general intelligence. So, to be honest, I'm not sure what this means, but the, the, the closest I can get is that it's this idea that we create an AI that can learn to do any intellectual task that humans or animals can do. Um, if we maybe supply it with enough data or give it enough time, um, therefore, uh, our job is kind of done, right? We can, we can happily let the AI um, solve all our problems, make us happy. Um, I'm not quite sure what intellectual means, um, but, but that's sort of the feeling we have with, with the, the term AGI, I think. Um, there are companies out there who believe that this is very imminent, um, but, but I worry about what AGI actually means. And we would need to get a little bit deeper into that first. Um, so I suppose you could say, well then, can we really do this? This is more what we used to call strong AI. Can we build a machine that is truly intelligent in the same way that we're intelligent? Whatever the word intelligence means. Um, well, this is difficult, but at least we might sort of come at it from the following angle, we could say, all right, well, we have one system we know that we regard as being intelligent, and that's the human brain, maybe the animal brain as well. All right, so perhaps that's what we're trying to do. Um, are we trying to build a mechanical, an artificial brain in AI? Um, mostly not. Um, by the way, some of the art that you'll see on these, on these slides, I'm quite proud of this art, so let's just go back. Look at that, beautiful. Um, I made all these pictures, actually. I used a generative AI to make all these pictures um, with very minimal effort, because I don't have a lot of time. But yes, basically a, a small text prompt creates the images that you've seen on the slides. They're just there for fun, but, but I mean, they're absolutely extraordinary, and I, I take no credit for them, um, but these are all the product of an AI, images like this. Okay, so if we want to understand the human brain, or we want to build an artificial brain, I think we probably need to understand a real brain, but this would take us to what I think is a very grand scientific goal, one that we're as far as I know, we're not very close to, but I'm a computer scientist, all right? So I will be very nervous about um, making claims about neuroscience or biology or physics. Um, but I think a full understanding of the workings of the human brain is, um, is quite some way away. And it's not really the thing that AI researchers and AI developers are trying to do. So this would be a strong AI kind of goal and maybe, maybe this can happen in the future, um, but if this is something we're trying to do, then um, please don't leave it to the computer scientists, would be what I would say. Um, uh, this is, you know, the human brain is, I guess, the most complicated system we know of in the universe. So um, figuring that out is, is a very grand goal. Um, and part of the problem with when people start talking about AI and intelligence and 
consciousness these kind of things come up. Part of the problem is that um, the questions are, the, the words are too loaded and the questions are, are not specific enough to really say anything meaningful about. Right? So I got this quote from a, an old book. Um, uh, Michael Arbib says, we have certain words for describing overall properties of our mental activity, consciousness, intelligence, but you shouldn't take these to refer to single entities, but they're referring to multiple properties to do with this brain, right, which is a cooperative phenomena and a product of interaction between a highly structured array of millions upon millions of neurons. So the brain is not a this, this one homogenous thing. The brain uh, has many different parts that do many different things and it's very, it's not really meaningful to just talk about the brain, how can we build the brain or even, you know, intelligence or um, consciousness, self-awareness, things like that. Um, there's a little bit of that flavour in this quote. So I'm going to start talking about a little bit of history. Um, and this is a long quote, I won't read the whole thing, but um, a fantastic quote from, from Alan Turing in 1950, um, where he said that he thought that in 50 years' time, about 50 years' time, we'd have uh, computers with a storage capacity of about 10 to the 9, which is pretty, pretty accurate. Um, and we'd be able to make them play this imitation game and pretty much uh, they would win most of the time. So the imitation game, if you're not aware of this, sorry, if you're not aware of this thing, um, the idea is that you have a human interrogator who's communicating with A and B via some sort of generic communication like uh, a computer screen or something so that you can't obviously tell. Um, and just through this communication, the idea is for C to try and figure out whether A and B, which one is the computer, and which one is the human. Um, so this is sort of a, a famous thing um, uh, that, that maybe isn't a, a perfect test of intelligence, but it's definitely a nice um, uh, thought experiment that helps us think about how we might um, decide if something's behaving intelligently or not. Um, but, but in the end of the, the other part of the quote here, Turing says um, essentially that, you know, he thinks that this, this might sound a little bit crazy right now, can machines think? He says that, I believe that to be too meaningless to deserve discussion, which is pretty much what I was saying a couple of slides ago, right? That, that it's, it's too broad, it's not well defined, we would need to break that down. Um, but he also says um, something interesting about science is that, you know, this, this belief that science is all about going from well-established fact to well-established fact um, and, and with, with no sort of influences from, from unproved conjectures, this is not really how it goes. Um, so people have been dreaming about artificial intelligence since, um, since this sort of time and um, we're, we've definitely seen some pretty amazing breakthroughs and some of these dreams start to sort of uh, come to fruition. But, but um, it's, it's interesting that, that you could, uh, that Turing was thinking about this in 1950, quite amazing actually. All right, so quick history, let's not spend too much time on the history and I'm gonna be highly selective um, because a lot of work has been done in the field of artificial intelligence as a scientific field. Born out of computer science, well, in fact, it starts essentially at the same time because in the late 1940s, the early 1950s, uh, this is when we started to build the first electronic computers. Okay. And almost immediately, um, scientists saw that these computers are able to now do some things, even just numerical calculations, that previously humans were sitting down and doing. And um, so it was this idea of automation comes up, 
and people start thinking, well, maybe this takes us on a path to um, the automation of intelligent behaviour. Um, so, so many people started getting exciting, uh, excited about that and then started following different paths of research that they thought might be the way to, to head towards this goal. Um, I'll, I'll ignore all of these paths except one. <laughs> and that path was to actually take a bit of inspiration from the brain, but very loose inspiration, and to try and do some models based on the brain, some principles of a, a neuron realised as a mathematical function, um, and then let's build models based on this. Let's connect a whole bunch of these neurons together and try and make it do something interesting. So people were doing this even back uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. There was a lot of excitement and a lot of scientific funding for AI in those times. Um, well, of course, I wasn't alive, so I can't say for sure. And I didn't get any of the funding, but um, there were... There were plenty of bold promises about AI. Um, some people thought that this would be achieved in 10 years or so. Um, and unfortunately what happened was people made bold promises and then it didn't turn out that way. It turned out to be much harder than anyone thought. Um, okay, so what happened after that? Well, in the late 1980s, there was a new wave of interest around these brain-inspired models, and we're going to call them artificial neural networks, and they learned from data to do intelligent things. So we were able to come up with algorithms, computer programs, problem-solving methods that could take some data and tune a model like this to do something useful, like pattern recognition. We'll see an example in a second. Um, so people got excited again in the 80s because we can't, the new algorithms were developed that seemed to work quite well. And then people lost interest again because there also seemed to be some problems with these neural network models. And in the late 1990s through to early 2010s, no one, talk, no one used the term artificial neural networks in, in the research um, field. I, I, I remember this part. Um, People talked about machine learning. The machine learning term came, became much more popular. And very roughly speaking, you could say that people thought, people could see the um, potential of these type of techniques that can, can use data to perform a task. But maybe neural nets, those neural net things are not the way to go. Right? We have statistical techniques, we have rule-based techniques, other mathematical techniques, we understand them better, we have theory that describes what they do, we can't understand those neural nets, we're going to focus on this. So it happened like that for quite a while. Most people, not doing neural nets, but a few people stuck with this stuff. And eventually, there were some big breakthroughs. It took a long time, um, but yeah, in the mid-2010s, what was happening underneath was Computers are getting bigger, more powerful. The internet's becoming faster, um, bigger, and there's a lot of data available. So it turned out that that, plus a few tricks, really made these neural network models work rather well. And people started using them again and, and showing that you could actually do um, uh, achieve much better performance than some of the machine learning techniques that people were using. So people would have uh, competitions in, in pattern recognition, for example, recognising what, what's in an image. Um, and, and these neural networks were all of a sudden able to achieve a much better result than the previous techniques. And suddenly, um, we're, we're very quickly at the level where uh, humans perform about the same on these data sets as the AI techniques. So on certain problems, things were looking very good there and that generated a lot more excitement and then we got a bit of a snowball going with this. 
Okay, so in the late 2010s through to now, what's happened? The models have got bigger and bigger and more and more impressive. The results get better and better and, and everybody gets excited. There's enormous interest. Companies get involved, researchers focus their attention and things get pretty, pretty exciting. And then we saw many major advances. Too many for me to, to um, uh, spend time on here tonight, but I'm just describing some of them generically here. Pattern recognition, speech recognition, large language models, chat GPT, um, systems that can translate <coughs> language for us, um, text to image, text to audio, text to video, things that can, can do those. Um, there's been many amazing breakthroughs. One of the first was this um, system that Google produced that people might have heard of um, called AlphaGo, which is essentially a large neural network that was able to beat the world champion Go player. Um, and when this stuff happened, I remember talking to AI research, other AI researchers about this, and I, none of us expected to see this happen in our lifetime because Go was considered such a grand challenge in, in AI. And suddenly, it's done. I mean, it's, it's, it was incredible. Um, so there's a lot of excitement around this stuff because almost every company, organisation, person performs some of these tasks um, as some part of their, their business or their lives. So these are generic tasks. This is what computer science is a lot, uh, a lot of the time computer science is about coming up with general purpose solutions to problems. So, let's have a, an example. Let's get into this. I just want to give you a taste of what kind of thing that we're talking about here with these neural network models, which are essentially driving all of the, all of the hype in AI. So I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, simplifying things a little bit, but when you hear the term AI in the media or whatever, mostly people are talking about neural network models. That's the magic thing that's really making a lot of, uh, a lot of things work. So let's have an example. Let's build an AI that can classify different species of penguin. So here's some, because who doesn't love penguins, right? So. Um, here's a, we have Adelaide, Chinstrap, Gen 2, and Plinfa. Do we have any penguin experts in the audience? Oh, that's good. I'm very, <laughs> very happy about that. And um, I'm particularly happy because um, that last penguin doesn't exist. I just made that up. <laughs> See, you can be deceived with AI. So that last picture is artificially generated by a text to image AI. That's not a real photo. The first three are photos. So you can also get it to generate that one if you want. Um, all right, so if I, if I ask you, let's focus on Adelie versus Gen 2. If we just look at those two penguins and I ask um, someone here to to um, come up with a way of predicting which species we're looking at. So that if I show you a new picture in a little bit, you'd be able to tell me whether it's Adelie or Gentoo. Right? So you could, you'd probably look at these pictures and, and um, you know, people have amazing visual systems in their brains. Um, you'd probably look at this and go, okay, I only need one example picture because uh, well, Gen 2 seem to have a, an orange beak. All right, maybe orangey feet as well. And also, obviously, Gen 2 penguins always look that way, and <laughs> Adelie penguins always look that way. So, okay, if, you, if that's your cue, then you may get things wrong. All right, but I think the, the orange beak is a good one. Okay, but an, so AIs, neural networks, can actually take image data like this and do the classification like we do um, right now. But we can simplify this hugely. 
if I don't have the image data or I can't handle the image data, I can still build an AI that can classify those two species of penguins. All I really need is a couple of um, measurements because it turns out, so what you're seeing here is a, is a graph of a data set. This is a freely available data set where we have the flipper length and the bill length of those penguin species plotted and you can see the, the, the colours there, the circles and the pluses showing the different species and when you look at this you can also see immediately, oh, well it looks like, you know, Gen 2s must be a little bit bigger, right? They have, tend to have larger, longer flippers and longer bills. So it seems like maybe I could classify these penguins just on the basis of those two measurements. I would, I would not know what the penguin looked like, but I could build an AI. There's an AI. <laughs> it's a rule. This rule says if the flipper length is larger than 205, then I should predict it's a Gen 2 penguin. Otherwise, I'll predict it's an Adelie. And that, on the data that I've that we have on the screen, it actually does a pretty good job of, of classifying. It gets a couple wrong because they're on the wrong side of the line. So the line sort of shows us where the decision of the rule lies. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So you could do this kind of thing to build AI, and in fact people do. This is a slightly more complicated set of rules it doesn't really do much better, but it's just an example to show you how you could make use of the bill length and have a rule that first checks the flipper length and then checks the bill length, makes the prediction, you would follow it through. All right. If you can understand this, then you, you, can, you can confidently say you know about some AI, you know about some machine learning, because this is a decision tree. Okay, and decision trees are used, they're very popular in practice. Okay, so I've worked with several different companies, government organisations, um, applying machine learning to data, to real world data, and people really like decision trees because they're understandable. You can look at the rules, go, oh, okay. And if someone asks you to explain what the prediction where did that prediction come from? How did the model arrive at that answer? You can explain it by tracing through the rules and seeing what, what decisions were made by the set of rules. All right? So that's a decision tree. Definitely useful. Um, and that's a classification problem. So a classification problem is a general problem where a computer program learns from a data set and builds us some sort of program, model, rule set for classifying things like penguins. Okay. Um, once the learning is done, then you should be able to use that model to classify penguins that you haven't seen before. Right? So this is the power of the, 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 the whole idea behind learning from data that you would um, train the model on some training data, then you can go and use it in the future forever and it will be able to classify things that it hasn't seen before. Just like you can do probably with uh, penguin images. Um, the AI knows nothing about penguins or any other application that you're applying it to except in terms of the patterns in the data that you fed into it. So that's all it can, can really do. So it's doing some kind of pattern recognition. But it's a very general purpose tool. Right? So um, it's not just for penguins. You can use it to classify cats and dogs. Um, important stuff, cancer versus non-cancer in, in some kind of um, medical, medical test result. Strawberries versus blueberries, perhaps. Unless you end up with this which is, this one is a strawberry that looks like a blueberry, and this one is a blueberry that looks like a strawberry, something like that. Um, again, these are fake, OK? 
okay. Um, this one looks a little, this one looks more appetizing than this one, somehow. <laughs> All right, well let's, so decision trees are nice, but they're not the thing that's really super hot and the thing that's causing all the breakthroughs. That's neural networks. So let me show you what a neural network is. Similar sort of problem. It's not real penguin data anymore, but you, you get the idea. It's orange and blue classes. We're trying to build a model that can predict the orange uh, versus the blue if you give it a new data point. And this is a, a neural network, sort of a picture of a neural network. The colour in the background here is showing you what prediction the network makes over all of these different possible values um, and the, the points are the training points. So it's showing you what it can do. All right? And what this neural network can do is basically put a line through this two-dimensional data space. It can divide the blue from the orange, separate the blue from the orange. Does a pretty good job of it. Um, now, a neural network, here's a little confession. A neural network is just a mathematical function. And this neural network you see on the screen is this mathematical function, where x1 and x2 are the inputs, um, and then there are two numbers here. These are the parameters of the model. The lines are sort of indicating um, those parameters. We call them weights in neural networks. Um, and then there's a, a specific kind of function here that you calculate and then you generate some sort of output. And if that output is, let's see, if that output is less than zero, then we're going to predict orange. If it's greater than zero, we're going to predict blue. Okay? So we have algorithms that can learn a function like this from data. Or I can say the same thing, train a neural network to learn this problem based on data. Okay? Well, what about what about a more complicated pattern? What if the blue and the orange look like that? Can, can I build a neural network to separate blue from orange? Yes, but you need a bigger one. All right, so see the, the picture you see now on the screen? Every one of these orange and blue lines will be a number in the mathematical equation. And those numbers are the parameters. Those are the things that the algorithm figures out when it's training, when it's looking at the data. Um, and eventually, if you're, if you're lucky, you end up with a network like this and it can do that kind of separation of, um, of blue and orange. All right. And then try another pattern. Wow, it's, it's awesome, right? It can learn any type of pattern in the data um, that, that you would care to give it, possibly. Um, let's see one in action. And let's try something more difficult. So the, the pictures you've been seeing are from a, an online web demo that's, that's originally by using Google's library. Um, and you can play with this at home if you want to. Search for Neural Network Playground. Um, we can try and make it learn a complicated pattern like two spirals intertwined. That's pretty hard. Um, I know because I've tried this before. So let me, let me just make it work, or at least give it a chance, by making it bigger. All right, that's what, that's what deep learning's about in 2023. Make the model bigger. Look at all those weights. Look at all those parameters. Uh, random start. Click the go button, and, and this is the kind of thing that, that computer scientists just thrill, get thrilled about every day, just watching things like this on the screen. Um, so what is, the algorithm is running and it's basically searching for good parameters, good weight values, to try and separate the blue from the orange. Um, 
don't know if it's doing a good job or not. It's kind of, it's certainly doing something weird. All right, it's, maybe it's settled down a little bit now. Um, yeah, doesn't look like too much else is happening. You can see these are sort of, these are error values on the data. And this is quite a low number, which suggests that it thinks it's done a good job. <laughs> I mean, it has, because all of the orange points that it knows about are in an orange kind of region, and the same with the blue. So it's getting all of them right. But I know, I'm thinking the same as you, you look at the, at the shaded, the blue and the orange regions, and you think, hasn't really learnt the nice spiral pattern. It's a bit rough, isn't it? So, well, that's, that's the way it goes in, in deep learning, I'm afraid. And interestingly, if I, if I retrain this thing, I know everybody's excited to see it happen again. Does everyone remember what, it, what the pattern looked like? Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, probably what we'll get this time will probably not look exactly the same as the previous time. It might look quite different. But if we're lucky, it'll still give us a good... The, these um, loss values, this is a measure of its, how well it's doing on the training data. This number hopefully will come down close to zero. Although I could waste a lot of time watching it, couldn't I? So anyway, that's you, you, there you go, it's getting there. You get the idea. So this is the kind of thing that's going on under the hood when people talk about AI, uh, when people talk about deep learning. Super. All right. My, my research specifically is a little bit in this realm. So training neural networks is a type of optimization problem. That's another general kind of problem that computer scientists just love to solve. Mathematicians as well. Um, we have lots of techniques to solve optimization problems, like training those networks, but there is plenty that we don't understand. Um, so some of the questions that I'm interested in in my research um, is to do with the, the, the inherent difficulty of these problems. I mean, are there important real-world problems that we can't solve that are optimization problems? Um, and what does it even mean? How can we understand the nature of hard problems? And can we develop ways to automatically figure out which algorithms to use and how to set the magic dials and buttons that I haven't talked about? So that's a little bit of the, the, the kind of thing that, that fascinates me and, and um, gets me distracted when I'm having a shower or whatever. Um, okay, deep learning. Well, I think I already said this. If you this is the magic. It, it doesn't sound very magical, but, but this is essentially what it is. There's a lot of good stuff that's going on in the, in the research um, domain, but if I have to say one thing, it's that neural networks, we make them bigger and bigger, we train them on more and more data. Magic, they seem to perform better and better most of the time. This is what has got us to the point of things like ChatGPT, okay? And um, this could not have happened in the 1960s and it could not have happened in the 1980s because these numbers are very big. We need huge amounts of data and computing power, graphical processing units, games cards, <laughs> to make this possible. And this has really been the key driver and, and given us some of these incredible breakthroughs. Um, Pre-trained networks so the models that I was just showing you, these are so big and it takes so much effort to train them that pre-trained networks have become a commodity. People have started calling them foundation models. I don't know why, I don't like that word foundation. Um, but these are the kinds of things that you can now um, use as a starting point and 
in some cases, you can download these and potentially fine tune those models to your specific application. Um, in the last 12 months, I've had plenty of conversations with, with organisations that are seriously considering doing this in-house as part of, their, part of their future. And so that, that leads us to these, these models that you, you've probably heard of some of these names. Okay, these are, these are um, uh, models, foundation models that um, various companies uh, have produced. How big is big? Really big, folks, really big. Um, this is a plot, it doesn't go up to 2023, but it shows you the number of model parameters. So that's, <coughs> that's the number of those connections on the, remember the neural net we were training, the lines? Each one of them is a single number. That's a, a weight, that's a parameter. So in GPT-4, which is the paid chat GPT, if anyone pays for this, um, that model has 1.76 times 10 to the 12 parameters. It's almost, I mean, it's impossible to comprehend these big numbers. Um, DALI is, is a, the, one of the, the state-of-the-art method for the image generation stuff. If you, use, if you use Bing at the moment, you'll get DALI underneath it. Um, that has about 12 billion parameters, apparently. Stable diffusion is another image generation technique. It only has one billion. Um, sometimes I try and think of a good way of, for people to get a handle on how big these numbers are. So I did a quick calculation according to what Google tells me a grain of rice weighs. And apparently a billion grains of rice is about 20 tonnes. So if we got... If we got 20 tonnes of rice delivered to the edge tonight, we would have enough rice grains to capture the parameter size of the smallest model I've mentioned there. One billion. All right, GPT-4, 1.76 trillion. It's um, quite amazing. Um, the graph you see here on the left, don't worry about the the words too much, this is, a, this is the data size versus the date people publish research papers. And again, we're up to you know, 10 to the power of 12 here. And this is a log scale on the y-axis, which means this line is showing you exponential growth, roughly. Um, so the data is getting very, very big. The models are getting very, very big. There are other things that are getting very, very big as well. Um, if you look at the value of some companies, um, and, and, and I say the biggest companies that are working on AI right now, well, firstly, let me say a big part of AI research is now being done by companies in-house. And the major, major companies involved, Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, Alphabet, um, Facebook, Meta, these are sort of, you know, order of a couple of trillion dollars. Um, Amazon is very interested and hugely invested in AI, Tesla, obviously. Um, you know, you get, when, when this kind of thing starts happening, we start to get into a very unusual situation with, with scientific research. Um, so let me finish with a couple of thoughts about challenges. Firstly, from the point of view of the research, right? Um, and these unfortunate these things are sometimes, but they're facts. There's so much AI research going on that no one can keep up. Unfortunately, that is true. The peer review system is under extreme pressure in AI. Um, we use peer review to try and ensure that scientific quality and publications is, is you know, publications are of high quality, but it's very difficult when um, these are uh, major conferences in AI that used to have a few hundred papers submitted and then it just went like this. Uh, the Neurips conference this year had over 12,000 papers submitted. It used to be a few hundred, okay. Um, so, Unfortunately, our scientific understanding of what's going on 
we can see that these big models work really well if you give them lots of data and you train them, but there's a lot we don't understand. So it's very good to be skeptical. It's very good to question things that you hear about AI and apply some common sense, <laughs> apply some scientific method, statistics, validation, testing. There is plenty of opportunity for things to go wrong with AI. Um, it's very nice to have enormous companies doing AI research. Indeed, they have been responsible for some of these big breakthroughs, many of them. Um, but they're also likely to focus on making things work and positive results. And sometimes we need to focus on negative results and making sure that things work and understanding why they work and when they don't work because they're not magic. So some challenges there in the research area, although, I mean, I would not be doing anything else at this point. It's an amazing time to be, to be doing AI research. Challenges in application, I'm sure you've all sort of become aware of some of this stuff as well. Um, building and training these big AI models, it requires such computational resources that only the biggest companies can do it. ChatGPT supposedly costs 700,000 US dollars per day to run. Um, there are lots of concerns about people's jobs. There are concerns about AI models being trained on stuff without consent of the, the artists, the writers, copyright ownership, IP. There are um, if governments around the world are talking about whether these models need to be regulated because they're so powerful. Um, pe other people argue that we need to open source and make these models freely available. Um, moral and ethical quandaries, of course, concerns over misuse, um, harm, uh, misinformation, security, all of these things are, are, big, are big concerns. I don't have the answers to any of these things, but um, uh, I'm sure that we need to spend a lot more time on them and not just computer scientists, but, but many, many other people need to get together to, to work on this stuff. I think AI is perhaps the most significant technological revolution in history. I think that's true. And it has the potential for enormous positive impact, but also enormous negative impact on humanity. So. Um, the future is going to be interesting, I think, but potentially a little bit hard to predict. Thank you. Wow, what a tour de force and equations. What more could you want from an AI talk? Just one. We have I've got a bunch of questions already come in, but now is your chance to pull out your phones, ask those questions. The QR code is back up. Uh, don't forget, of course, this talk is going to be available on YouTube next week, uh, if not late this week. And um, I'd love you to head to our YouTube, head to our Facebook, and um, are we on X still? I don't know, I make a lot of Elon jokes. He might have kicked us off by now. Um, but follow us on social media because we have one more uh, talk this year on the 6th of November and it is our Briz Science Science Spectacular where we are doing a science comedy show. Um, so I'm, we're hosting a science panel show you know, in the style of QI and Spicks and Specs and that sort of show. We have comedians, researchers, and, or comedians, PhD students and professors all duping it out for the big science stories of the year. It's going to be a fantastic evening. It'll be a special 90 minute for science. So um, get in early for those tickets because they are definitely going to sell out quickly. Uh, I'm hosting it as the MC, so you know, I'm, I'm doing a big plug there. But let's get back to the questions. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Let's jump into the, 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 the meaty ones um, first. So, Howard asks, given a proliferation of conflicting information, how can we be sure that AI will be the interest of community at large? And uh, maybe I'll add Tony's question, which is, um, how does AI deal with fake news and 
all the data, you know, how does it know what's true and what's false? Wow, okay, we're, we're getting straight into it. Um, excellent questions. We don't know. I mean, there is no, so the, the AI techniques, the, the AI tools that have been released, especially the language models, um, have a lot of guardrails put on them by the companies. Um, some time ago, Microsoft originally tried this, maybe a couple of years ago, I don't know if anybody remembers, Microsoft um, let, let a, a language model agent loose on the internet and within a couple of days people had got it to start spouting hate speech and all this awful stuff and they had to take it down and they were very embarrassed. So there were extensive guardrails on these things to stop them doing bad stuff. Um, but are those guardrails, can you rely on them? I don't think so. There's no way, I, I'm sure they've tried to test them as, as well as they can, but there are no guarantees on that sort of thing. Um, there's no guarantees on the correctness of the, the output that you get from a large language model. And they're, they're very good, they can do a lot of good stuff, but, but they're not intelligent, I would suggest to you. They just regurgitate strings of text that they think are the likely response to the prompt that you entered and perhaps history of prompts that you've entered. So that, that needs to be read with, with you know, very critical eyes and, and high degree of scepticism. Um, so I don't have, yeah, there's no magic <coughs> solutions to this misinformation stuff either. I think a, a language model can potentially, if, if the guardrails were, were removed or, or circumvented, um, this kind of thing could be putting out bad stuff on the internet just like people put bad stuff out on the internet. It's a problem. I, I have to say, when I look at Twitter, I think most people there are just responding to prompts as well. But um, sorry, Elon. Um, okay, we've got a bunch of questions around data usage and ethics and training. Yes. So, okay. um, Spurthy asks ethical implications of data, and David asks, with AI feeding so much into the internet, and most AI using the internet for training, for learning, do we end up in a circular loop where AI is just collapsing in on itself? Mm. Okay, so the, the first part about, about the data, well, we've, we have all of these big models that have been produced by big companies and um, essentially, you know, again, for the language models that, and for the image models as well, um, the internet has been trawled and all of it, more or less, has been used to train these models. Um, that it, recently it's kind of, there have been some issues. It seems like that might have included, for example, big repositories of pirated books <laughs> that nobody had given permission for them to use. Um, images, well, if you put images out on the internet, I guess it's fair game, but, but I'm no lawyer, all right? So I, it's difficult for me to answer um, questions here. I, I suspect things, wrong things probably have been done in the process of training some of these models. Um, yeah. What was the second part? The second part was on if the AI, if, uh, if the, the internet circuit. is getting written by AI and the yep. AI is reading the internet to train itself. Yes. Um, does this work going forward? Um, another question I don't know the answer to. <laughs> so, but, but there's been a lot of talk about this issue that if, if we train models on data and then the output of the model is just used to create more data, we get this sort of circular thing, do we end up training it to, to a point where it's not very useful? Um, there's, there's been some evidence that this might have happened for, for some of the language models that um, in the previous version were very good at generating computer code, for example, 
and then the next version it seems that they were not so good anymore. Um, so I think it's definitely something that's possible. It's something we, we don't understand how to measure and do experiments to, to, to sort of measure how it's degrading. And also, I think the, the creativity aspect is probably not that hard to solve. I think um, if you allow the models to be supplemented by a bit of, bit, bit of human input plus a bit of random exploration, um, I don't think it's a huge problem, but I'm speculating. Speculating. Right. Seb had a question. Has AI ever made any scientific discoveries or advancements? Yes. So I, yes, absolutely. So one of the one of the um, covers of Nature I put up was uh, Nature is sort of very highly regarded scientific publication. Um, one of the covers there was from Google's AlphaFold system. So some of you might have heard about AlphaFold. AlphaFold is a system that can predict um, the, the folding structure of proteins and, and molecules and things like that. Um, now, I'm not a scientist from that domain, but um, from what I've seen, um, biologists talking about this stuff, this is seen as a major breakthrough um, to have a model that can predict this structure where previously um, that would have involved running a very time consuming simulation um, that would have you know, taken days, months, weeks to, to produce a prediction for one molecule. And now we have AlphaFold that can produce thousands of these for you. So there's huge potential here for, for um, discovering new drugs, understanding better some, some diseases um, and, and so on. So there's, there's amazing things going on. If, if I, can I be nerdy for one second? Absolutely. So in, in a real science like mathematics, um, <laughs> there was another Nature paper recently where, where um, I think it was Google again, they, they do a lot of stuff, um, Google came up with a neural net that discovered a faster algorithm for mi matrix multiplication. That doesn't sound very exciting to some people, but matrix multiplication is a, such a fundamental operation in every, almost every bit of software that you use. And, and, um, and they, this algorithm improve, was an improvement on the previous one that, that was come up, that people came up with in the 1960s. So no mathematician had been able to improve on this algorithm since the 1960s and, and um, this AI. For, for certain specific cases, there are some limitations, but this AI was able to, to make improvement there where I think people thought that it was, there were no further improvements possible. Um, you got time for a couple more questions? Oh, sure. We're, 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 we're going to power through, but... Yep, okay. So we'll go one serious, and then we'll go for one, um, you know, big picture. Okay. So it was a question... I'm sorry, I've lost it. Whoever asked it, I must have accidentally clicked off, which was about hardware and how we try to speed up hardware. And maybe the best way to phrase that is from Isaac. How fast would the best AI sort out one trillion penguins? <laughs> <laughs> One trillion penguins. Well, um, I'd have to do the calculations there. So, someone asked ChatGPT. Quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, getting a model to actually produce a prediction for an image is is not that time consuming. I mean, it's a matter of milliseconds with, with the biggest model. Um, so, I don't think that that's a huge problem. Um, Doing things with chat G, something like ChatGPT takes uh, quite a bit more computational effort because it, it's looking at the text that you've typed into it and it's trying to predict in time, unfolding, what, what this sequence that you've fed into it. The, the model's more complicated, it takes more, takes more computing time. But it's not too bad, right? I mean, everybody here can run chat GPT in more or less in real time on the web um, thanks to 
thanks to OpenAI spending $700,000 a day. Um, it's the training that's really a problem. So the, the training of these models is months and months on the biggest computers um, that these companies have. And, and none of us can do that on, on, on our own computers at the moment. Good. And that was Captain Kirian's question. Thank you, Captain Kirian. Last question. This is the one that's sort of in here a lot, which is long term, can we ever see a sentient AI and what would that mean? So, if you're trying not to offend some future robot overlord, then. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I have no idea. I have no idea whether that's possible um, and, and what it would mean. Uh, obviously, this, this gets to the core of, of um, humanity somehow. Um, but, but I would answer the question slightly better by saying this. Think about what I said at the start, that, that, that we have this weak AI idea. All right? So I don't, I'm not too worried about true sentience, but I'm, I'm worried about when we have a system that is, operates so well that we can't tell the difference anymore between, say, an interacting with ChatGPT versus interacting with a real person. Um, when we, if we can't tell this anymore, then I think, yeah, we have to really think carefully about that. That's absolutely coming in the not too distant future, I would say. Yeah. Uh, look, what an amazing um, insight into an absolutely cutting edge field, which you're showing is evolving every day with the 5,000 odd papers that uh, appear at conferences. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat to us. Um, please join me in thanking our speaker tonight for an incredible presentation. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Don't forget to join us next month for our final event of the year. And please come and join us for some food and drink outside and have a chat with our speaker. We'll see you all soon.